Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this uh, session here at the JNF 2020. So this is to bind or not to bind a guide in 2020. Quick disclaimer here. So my name is Johan McGuire. I'm a system engineer for Coinbase. Uh, you might know me on Slack as Johan. So with this to bind or not to bind, we're going to cover first, um, we're going to define the deployment scenarios that usually are involved uh, with provisioning devices evaluate the different identity methods and new uh, identity platforms that are utilized and how those integrate with devices, discuss the security implications of those uh, methodologies and how they implement, cover a couple quick random topics, and then we'll also just wrap it up with assessing the transition away from binding as a whole. So just a quick preface on this presentation, the views are my own, they do not reflect Jamf or Coinbase. And this, to some degree, is a little bit of an opinionated piece, especially once we get towards the security implications and the security stances of these. Lastly, it is a bit of a dynamic environment that's going on right now. So there are changes uh, with identity providers and stuff going on. So make sure that you test everything thoroughly through this. So with that, there are a couple of requirements that I want to make sure that you have in place before really embarking down this adventure. First, make sure that you have automated device enrollment set up for your environment if you don't already. Have an externally facing and resolvable MDM that's fully functional off your internal network. And lastly, have a centralized identity infrastructure already in place. And that could be a cloud identity platform or even an on-premise identity one, which we'll cover them later. So before that, let's talk about what happened at WWDC this year. So with that, one primary interesting change that Apple sort of talked about was to leverage local accounts very, very much strongly over mobile accounts. And with that, leverage identity and the new features with the SSO enrollment customization to your advantage and bake those in to your deployment methodologies right from the get-go, rather than just trying to layer them on top once you have everything else configured. A couple sessions I highly recommend you look into and watch after this, if you haven't already. Leverage enterprise identity and authentication, as well as deploying Apple devices using zero touch. So with that, let's take a look at our identity platforms. And specifically, over the past couple years, there's been what's going on sort of called a, a digital transformation. And with that, our historic on-premise identity providers like Active Directory, Open Directory, and LDAP, as well as a couple others, which I won't mention, have been migrating more to the cloud or just completely just getting replaced with cloud-based identity providers like Azure, Okta, and G Suite. So keep that in mind as we move towards this. But first, let's talk about our different deployment scenarios, which you might see during uh, that we're building out environments for. Now with this, you have your one to, your many to many and your one to one deployment scenarios. And an organization usually will have more of one or the other, but it might be a pretty healthy mix sometimes. So with that, a many to many deployment scenario is when you have multiple users which have the ability to log into multiple machines and be instantly productive. While uh, and with many to many, that's primarily your academic lab spaces or your shared workstations. While one-to-one -one deployment scenarios where you have a single user utilizing a single machine is typically your enterprise-based deployment methodologies. So with that, let's quickly hop into and discuss the issues with traditional binding, especially in a multi-user scenario. And unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of new news with regard to the issues that everyone's been uh, infamous about and know about. Specifically, our keychain synchronization prompt issues, still really the same here. Also, there's been a difficult health reporting for a very long time with Active Directory and binding. Specifically, if your uh, device doesn't communicate with your domain after 60 or 90 days, that AD object might be completely deleted, and therefore any password or new login operations just simply aren't functional. But with that, there's been a couple different new challenges which have presented themselves especially in our day and age of transitioning to more repo, uh, remote working. The first one I like to call 
FileVault password irrecoverability. And what this is, is when you're in a scenario where you have mobile accounts and a user that's forgotten their password and working remotely, if they need to reset their password utilizing the, your FileVault uh, recovery key, whether that be personal or an institutional recovery key, when you're in that rec um, the recovery mode and executing that recovery, your device actually needs connectivity to your domain controller or generally your just IDP on premise. And unfortunately, in a remote work scenario, that's just not possible, leaving you in a situation where you can't recover that machine. Also, due to that lack of network connectivity, typical password synchronization using traditional binding at the login window doesn't work because there's no connectivity at the login window to your identity provider on premise. This means that most password and synchronization operations don't actually perform the way you'd expect and fail silently for going back to the cache credentials on the machine. So with that, let's look at what options there are for many-to-many -many deployment scenarios. The first, just like we talked about with an on-premise IDP, is the traditional bind. But to help solve that FireVault password irrecoverability, there's another option, Nomad Login, which you've probably heard about already. This offers the ability to use local accounts instead of the mobile accounts, allowing you to use password recovery operations using that FileVault key, and also has the ability to use the Nomad login, uh, the Nomad agent itself to get more visibility and management capabilities for your network accounts for your users that are using the machine on a day-to-day -day basis. This is more viable in our remote work environment because it supports a full uh, VPN to be able to communicate to your on-premise um, uh, directory uh, identity providers. But we haven't talked about cloud IDPs yet. So let's take a look at those. Jam Connect is going to be your primary usage. <coughs> your primary use if you're using a cloud identity provider. It gives you the ability to use local accounts, but it comes with a little quick caveat that there are restrictions of functionality per identity provider that you might use with Jam Connect. While um, Azure is fully supported for password synchronization using both OIDC and ROPG-based authentication mechanisms, so, um, currently Google, as I want to use as a, a example here, currently doesn't support ROPG authentication. So password synchronization isn't going to be an option with them at this point in time. So with that, let's start going into our one-to-one -one based deployment in scenarios. So with that, I want to take a second here to discuss the login window um, versus setup system and specifically the realms of user creation. So with the login window, this is where your traditional bind, nomad login, jam connect come into play. While with setup assistant, there are a couple of different options there that are available for creating your users just in time, but are more tailored for one to one based deployment mechanisms. And that's credential auth. This is your standard uh, require authentication uh, on uh, DEP enrollment. And then also you have your SSO enroll enrollment customization, which actually um, uses the Jam Connect OIDC based uh, authentication mechanisms to fully support multi-factor. So with that, let's talk about the security implications between the login window and the setup assistant. So with that, the setup assistant authentication happens before enrollment and full configuration takes place. There's no preloaded identifiable assets at the time at which authentication is occurring. Also, there's no pre-installed organization specific programs or organization specific security settings that can be investigated. The fully Apple supported method and I believe was actually demoed at last year's JNUP keynote. This means that from a security stance, if there's a malicious attacker trying to that's, that's compromised one of your devices and they're trying to enroll it, they won't have access to any of these things if you use a pre uh, setup assistant based enrollment and identification method. So when we graph all of our methods of enrollment out with, um, and then also put our LDAP, this is our user and password based authentication, and then also add in our multi-factor supported um, enrollment mechanisms, the SSO enrollment customization 
is the only one that actually takes advantage of both of those factors. So with that, let's go down and analyze all these, these options. So for a one-to-one -one based deployment, where you're using a login window based methodology, you have Nomad login and the traditional bind available for on-prem IDPs. These offer password synchronization, but require direct domain connectivity. Nomad login does have the benefit of using uh, local accounts to be able to authenticate, uh, therefore being able to give you that file vault recoverability options. Jamf Connect comes in with password synchronization and MFA capability due to using your cloud identity providers as well. Though it does come with that same caveat that I mentioned before about different identity providers behaving differently and being differently supported by Jamf Connect. Now with that, let's go over to the setup assistant based methodologies. With Credential Authenticated Automatic Device Enrollment, or DEP, the username and password can be actually used to authenticate from your on-premise identity provider using what's called a GIM or a Jamf Infrastructure Manager to proxy that traffic from your Jamf server to your identity, prover, uh, identity provider and then back. The SSO enrollment customization takes that up one notch with the ability to then support MFA for your cloud and the also on premise. Disconnected. Um, the conference will be terminated in for your um, MFA capability as well as password um, for your MFA capability. This also supports on premise as well as um, remote identity providers. Uh, the thing is though is that SSO enrollment customization does not support password synchronization due to uh, the fact that it's using OIDC based authentication mechanisms. That being said, let's hop over real quick and talk about that password synchronization. And this is where we get into the opinionated based talk. In my opinion, password synchronization provides no direct security benefit for an organization. This is due to the fact that MDM configuration profiles can be used to enforce your, your password security settings onto the local device itself, therefore enabling your local device password to mimic the exact and match the exact same security preferences that you have for your domain controllers or your identity provider as the whole. Also with that, password desynchronization is actually more secure in some degrees as because if you have a different password on your local machine versus the one that's used to authenticate to your network resources, that once a, a, a if an attacker compromises the local machine, that password does not get that they've compromised, does not guarantee them access to your network resources. Therefore adding another hurdle for the attacker to get over, therefore making your environment more secure. Now, we talked about security. Let's go back to WWDC. Apple recommended that to use local accounts, but also said that if um, there are options, um, if there are, that there are reasons and certain situations where binding might be necessary. Let's demystify those a little bit. The primary reason for using uh, binding with local accounts, as far as I can see it is directory file shares or DFS. Right now, there doesn't seem to be a third party support mechanism for this. That being said, another one that's commonly said, which is not actually the case anymore, is 802.1 uh, certificates used for network, um, for Wi-Fi and, and Ethernet based authentication. There are alternatives to be able to support this, including the Jamf ADCS connector, as well as the SCEP proxy, with the ADCS connector being released recently, with the SCEP proxy being a couple years old. Now, with that, let's continue on and really talk about file vault here. FileVault is not advisable in many to many deployment scenarios, especially in um, shared academic lab spaces, due to the fact that when, if a, the device is shut off and a brand new user to the machine walks up, their account will not be there. That means that their account won't have a secure token, which means that their account won't be able to be used at the FileVault log, the FileVault window to be able to actually boot Mac OS and then use the machine to become productive. And with that, I specifically say the file vault window because the file vault screen 
does not equal the logger window. If the um, if you have FireVault enabled on your many-to-many -many machines, but then also utilize Jamf Connect or another login window replacement program like Nomad Login or anything similar, you can actually have an environment where you log in, the device shut, turns on, you authenticate to the FileVault window, transition into macOS once you've authenticated, and the microOS login window, but then actually have to re-authenticate to the device. This leads to an extremely poor user experience and doesn't provide much security as this is easily disableable via recovery mode by any savvy user or any savvy attacker. That's why at leveraging the SSO enrollment consultation and being able to utilize your device to on the first go to authenticate is the primary way of doing it. Now with that, we've talked about the caveats, we've talked about the random topics. Let's jump in and talk about how to move away from um, mobile accounts and binding because there's some, been some pretty good things that have come up over the past couple of months. So with that, previously, transitioning from the bind and demobilizing an account has been done by a script that Rich Troughton put out a couple of years ago, which is fantastic. That being said, there's been some recent releases with Nomad Login 1.4 that's really helped this out. So previously, before the, the 1.4 release, Demobilization really, to some degree, required you to use Nomad Login to be able to then get the password and then demobilize the account. Recently, that's changed with our 1.4 release. This is because we've been able to, to discouple it and completely decouple the demobilization mechanism from Nomad Login so that even if you're authenticated at the file vault um, screen or the built-in macOS login window, the demobilization mechanism can be used completely standalone to demobilize those accounts. Also, we've added a couple smart card capabilities, which we'll talk about in a sec. So demobilization, it's as simple as two command lines. After you install a Nomad login, just using the built-in package, we can use the auth changer command to insert the demobilization mechanism into the login mechanisms, and then simply use a default write command to enable the demobilization and the Nomad login plist. From that point, you can completely step away as an administrator, and once the user walks up to the machine and logs in for the first time via whatever way they please, that user will actually automatically be demobilized. Now, let's talk about those six smart card options that, we, that I mentioned before. So with that, smart cards are predominantly used in an enterprise environment by using attribute mapping to the alt security identity profile attribute. So with that, most demobilization mechanisms actually removed the alt security identity attribute. This led to breaking of smart card mappings and re restricting of usage in local accounts. Thankfully, we added uh, the demobilize save alt security identity preference in Nomad Logon 1.4, which allows for that attribute to be maintained and therefore allowing for demobilization, continuing on past um, um, allowing uh, demobilization with smart cards. Also, after you've demobilized your entire fleet, one thing I want to point out is that this um, profile attribute can be automatically written using outset or any other scripting mechanism you'd want to be able to write that to the, act, the profile, therefore allowing smart cards to be universally supported across your environment. So with that, here are some quick sources that I used and Thank you very much for joining my presentation.